I'm going to invite you to take a seat and to grab your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the Gospel of Luke. Chapter 6 is where we're going to be today, Luke chapter 6. Uh, if you don't have a Bible with you, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 1025 and you will find the text for today. And as always, if you need a Bible, you don't have one, and you want to read the Bible, then please take one of these with you. It's our gift to you, because we want you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God, because we know if you do that, God will change your life. Hey, while you're finding Luke chapter 6, let me just tell you about something I'm excited about in January. I know, January is a long way off, right? Uh, I mean, we are in November now, you guys realize that, but I mean, we still got Thanksgiving, and we've got Christmas, and we got New Year's, and all that kind of stuff, but we hit January. We're going to be doing a church-wide uh, series for seven weeks called Freeway, A Not-So-Perfect Guide to Freedom. And, uh, and as, as a church-wide emphasis, we're going to be offering uh, life groups, and people can be a part of life groups. And because God keeps sending us more people, we need more life groups. And so I want to take a moment now and just kind of say, hey, if you're somebody who's got some experience leading life groups, whether it's another church or here at Calvary, or you're somebody who goes, ah, what's the big deal about leading a life group? I could do that. People in my living room, some questions, a prayer, we got this. Uh, then if you are interested in helping us for at least seven weeks, not asking for a longer commitment than that, January and February of 2018, then would you just email lifegroups at calvarylhc.com, lifegroups at calvarylhc.com, and and the life group pastor, Mike Wilkinson, will get in touch with you, and he'll just explain what's uh, required, what we're asking, answer your questions. So we're not, we're not asking for a commitment. We're just asking for some interest that maybe God's leading you to do that, and you consider that you might be a part of leading in that way. Uh, I hope all of you will be a part of uh, the Freeway series, but we do need some extra leaders. Uh, I'd love for us to have about 10 or 15 uh, new life groups that people could join for those seven weeks and uh, seven weeks that can change your life. So we're kicking off a new series today, and it's called Money Talks. Uh, what does yours say besides goodbye? Right? Because it says that a lot, right? In, in, in our lives, and in, in fact, most American households, uh, I did some research about money in, in America, and this is what I found out. The average U.S. household has $137,000 in total debt. Of that... The average household has $16,000 in credit card debt, $50,000 in student loan debt, and $29,000 in auto loan debt. That is a lot of goodbyes, isn't it? Here's a surprising and frightening statistic. 57% of American families have less than $1,000 in savings. Six out of ten Americans aren't ready for any kind of emergency in their life. They have no financial margin whatsoever. So money talks, and we need to talk about money. And when we talk about money in church, there's a lot of people who kind of protest, who kind of go right away, hey, 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 can't we just study the Bible and talk about Jesus and, and his stuff? Yeah, that's why we talk about money. See, at Calvary, we believe the Bible is the inerrant, inspired Word of God that tells us what to believe and how to live. And, and so we teach from this book. So, for instance, uh, we teach about believing in God because the Bible talks about believing 272 times in these pages. Kind of a big deal. Uh, we, we talk about praying because the Bible mentions prayer 371 times in Scripture. Hey, we're all about loving our neighbor, loving God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength because the Bible talks about love or tells us to love 714 times in its pages. That's a lot. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to lean over to your neighbor and I want you to guess and, and put something online like who's paying for lunch, okay? I want you to guess how many times the Bible uses the word give or giving. Give or giving how many times does the Bible use it? Right? you got five seconds to do this real quick. You, don't have, you can't figure out where you're buying lunch, just where, who's, who, you know, what's your guess is? You got your number? You got your number? Okay, so the number is over 2,000 times. Okay, who, who was close? Who was close? Okay, got some people who are close. Okay, maybe you've heard someone preach on this before. I don't know, but two thousand three three times as often as it tells us to love, it talks about giving. So money talks and we need to talk about money. God knew that this would be an issue that we struggle with, that we battle. He knew that we'd be this much in debt and all those kinds of things. 
So here's the question that I want to encourage you to wrestle with this week. Uh, talk with God about it as a couple talk about it, maybe as a family discuss it. What does your bank statement say about your life? What does your bank statement say about your life? It, money talks. So if we looked at how you spend your money, what would it tell us about your life? Now, I, I know that's kind of a, that, that's a personal question. But here's the thing. If you looked at the Garrison family uh, bank statement, okay? I can't say budget because a lot of us have budgets we don't live by, right? But if you looked at our bank statement, what you would find from those pages is that somebody in our household has an Amazon addiction. And it is not me, okay? So my wife, Meralda, she struggles. She's got this Amazon addiction. She's still in the denial stages of that. But in her defense, she suffers from GCSS, grandchild shopping syndrome. So she sees stuff. She goes, oh, they just need to have that. And I'm going, oh, no, they don't even care about that. But uh, some of you are, are afflicted with that same kind of disease, right? And, and if you looked at the Garrison family bank statement, you'd also discover a strong commitment to the kingdom of God, especially here at Calvary, uh, because the single largest expenditure out of our expenses each month is, is directed to Calvary. And, and you'd also discover that uh, the Garrisons eat out way too much. Now, there's really three reasons. First one is we're empty nesters, and sometimes it's just easier uh, the other two is because it combines two of my loves, people and food. So, uh, so what does your bank statement say about your life? You see, this series that we're in is based on four questions for you to answer. Not to give me an answer, but for you and God to have a conversation and you guys to, to talk and figure out what you need to do because we're just going to examine the Bible, apply the teaching, and ask this question because money talks. And today, does yours say that you're wise? Does your money say that you're wise? Let's start off by listening to Jesus. Luke chapter 6, verses 37 and 38. This is in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount as Luke records it. Jesus says, Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Today, I'd like to introduce you to the biblical principle of reciprocity. The biblical principle of reciprocity, that's really just a fancy word that means we reap what we sow. We reap what we sow. This is a concept that's found in Scripture over and over and over again. Uh, and, and let me just be really clear. When we talk about we reap what we sow, we're not talking about karma. In fact, uh, I think karma is crap. And I can say that because I spell it with a K. And, uh, but, but I'm just going to say, say this. There's a lot of stuff that's posted on social media, a lot of concepts in our world that uh, are anti-biblical, anti-Christ, and karma is one of those. So as the people of God, let's just agree that we're not going to talk about it, use it in, in that context, <laughs> except the way that I just defined it. Uh, karma, just for the record, is a Hindu and Buddhist concept that says the way you lived your previous life impacts the life you have now, and the way you're living now will impact your next life, and you'll do that over and over and over again until you get it right. Uh, in case you're wondering, the Bible says it is appointed unto man once to die and then judgment. Guys, we do not believe in karma. We believe in reciprocity, that you reap what you sow. And, and, and so, uh, let, you know, let's just go ahead and, and embrace that idea and live that out in our words and our social media and stuff like that. And, and you know, I'm not asking you to burn the t-shirt that says karma is, anyway. Uh, but... Uh, but I'm just saying, I want us to know this, because we're followers of Jesus, and, and we ought to understand. The Word of God, the Apostle Paul, Galatians chapter 6 says, Don't be deceived, God cannot be mocked. Whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. If he sows to the flesh, from the flesh he's going to reap destruction. If he sows to the Spirit, from the Spirit he will reap eternal life. And all of us ha are, are going to live in this reciprocity. We're going to reap what we sow, whether we're sowing to destruction or whether we're sowing to life. 
it's going to happen. So Jesus, in his words, let's just summarize what he said. He said, if you desire acceptance and kindness, forgiveness and blessings, then be accepting, merciful, gracious, and generous. Isn't that what he just said? If you desire acceptance, kindness, forgiveness, and blessings, then be accepting, merciful, gracious, and generous. So let's just check this out. How many of us want people to judge us? Nobody really raised their hand. You don't want to walk into the room and go, oh, look what she's wearing. Oh, do you think they gained weight? Well, of course, we're eating. Uh, do, 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 can you believe what they said? Can you believe what they did? Can you believe, you know, look, we don't want people to do that to us, so why would we do that to people? Why would we judge people? How about instead of judging them, we actually get to know them and hear their story and learn about their life and then allow Jesus to change them? And I realize that's kind of a foreign concept in churches. So I grew up in churches where we preached about Jesus changing people, and as soon as somebody uh, confessed Christ as Lord, uh, then we just kind of put all kinds of expectations on them. In other words, we didn't trust God to do his job. We said, here's how you're supposed to live, and here's what you need to stop doing, and here's what you need to start doing, and here's how you... And and we just crushed them with these expectations. When Scripture tells us that the moment we confess Jesus as Lord, God the Holy Spirit moves into our heart, and and God the Holy Spirit is the one who convicts of sin. You know, if you tell me I have to do something, or I should do something, eh, I don't know, I'm kind of rebellious. You tell me I have to do it, I'm not going to do it. You guys like me that way? You kind of like, yeah, you can say, tell me whatever you want. I'm not going to do it. But here's the thing. When the Holy Spirit convicts me that I need to change, I change. When I come face to face with the truth of God and, and he brings that conviction to my life, nobody has to convince me. I want to do it. And the Holy Spirit's the one who's our teacher. And so he's the one who knows the pace that we're on learning. So how about we stop judging people and we just love people? and allow God to do his work in their lives. And and, and this whole condemnation thing, wouldn't you rather people be kind to you rather than condemn you? Wouldn't you you like, I mean, do you guys want people to be kind to you? Anyone besides me? I I really crave kindness. I, I don't like rudeness and stuff like that. You know, so why don't we just choose to be kind because that way, you know, we're not gonna be getting that condemnation back. By the way, when we're talking about condemning people, How about we stop asking God to casually condemn people, places, and things uh, with our language? It's not honoring to Jesus. Or or this whole forgiveness thing. You know, we want to be forgiven. In fact, that's the whole glorious part of the gospel, right? We come to Jesus. Jesus forgives us of all our sins. All of our sins. They're all covered by the blood of Jesus, past, present, and future. I mean, that's the amazing thing about grace. That's why we sing about it and celebrate it is because when you embrace Jesus, all of your sins are wiped out. They literally were put on Jesus. And so even though we deserve death, you know, because the wages of sin is death, I deserve hell. Okay, let me just put it that way. I deserve hell. And I'm pretty sure you do too because the Bible says so. But I know I deserve hell. And yet because of Jesus, I get heaven. Because of Jesus, I'm a child of God. Because of Jesus, I don't get what I deserve. That's forgiveness. And because of Jesus, you don't get what you deserve. And you know what he asks us to do with that forgiveness? Forgive others. If you want forgiveness, forgive. And, and, uh, and think about it this way. The moment we start talking about forgiveness, it's not an easy thing. It's, you know, we have to fight for forgiveness. But, but here's the thing. When you say, but you don't know, what they did to me. Um, God knows. God knows. He, was, he saw it. And some of us are just angry at God because God let bad stuff happen to us. But here's the reality. Here's why God wants you to forgive. Here's why God tells us to forgive. Because when we hold on to that bitterness and that anger, it hardens our heart, and we start living joyless, angry lives. Who does that hurt? Does that hurt the people we're angry at? No, it hurts us. So when God asks us to forgive, when he says, I want you to give forgiveness so that you can get forgiveness, what he's, do, he's saying is, look, I want you to forgive, not for them, but for you, so that your heart will be soft, so that there'll be joy in your life, so that, that you won't live that pain out every single day when you're holding on to that unforgiveness and that hurt. 
Because here's what happens. We hold on to that bitterness, then we're blocking ourselves from the grace of God that he wants to pour into our lives. He he just wants to pour that that, that grace into our lives so that it can just flow through us to other people. And when we stop forgiving, we stop living in the reality of grace. So God wants more grace in your life. The way you get that is you just forgive. You just live in forgiveness and it comes back to you. How about this? Who would like to be more blessed? You guys are hesitant to raise your hands on that one? Let's try that again. Who wants really to be more blessed? Okay, more hands go up. Okay. Anybody here want less blessings? See, I, 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 I can relate. I know that I am blessed way better than I deserve way better than I deserve. I got way more blessings than I should have, uh, and I get that, but I'm still greedy, and I ask God for more. I, I, I've never come to God and said, God, I've been blessed too much. Take some away. Deprive me of any future blessings. Uh, you know, now, reality is, I know I'm blessed, but I'm still wanting more blessings, and so when we want more blessings, we need to listen to Jesus because he counsels generosity. Give, and it will be given to you. Now, this is an eternal principle in Scripture, this whole reciprocity thing, that you and I cannot escape. We we can't get away from it. It applies to everyone. Whether you're a follower of Jesus or not, you're living in a place in this world where you're going to reap what you sow. But if you are a follower of Jesus, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, and you believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins, and was raised from the dead, and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then you ought to grasp this reciprocity idea, and you ought to live by it, because you believe it, and it's in the Word. And then, not only is reciprocity real, we reap what we sow, but here's the stunningly crazy part. Jesus says that we determine the amount we receive. We determine the amount we receive. The measure you use will be measured back to you. Now just pause. That means we decide the amount of acceptance and kindness in our lives. I hate to say this, but if everybody is rude and nasty to you, there might be a reason for that. You might want to look in the mirror and have a conversation with God about how you're treating people. If if you want more kindness, then be kind. If, If you want forgiveness and blessings in your life, then you decide the amount by the actions that you take the way that, that you live your life. And, and, and let's just be honest, it's really hard to kind of measure how you know, merciful and graceful people are, but generosity is far more tangible. So the more blessings we want to receive, the more generous we choose to be. Let me say it again, the more blessings we want to receive, because we all said we want more blessings, then Jesus actually tells us, it will then, then practice generosity. So I've got this, you know, illustration to kind of show you what it looks like because it, it makes sense to me when I, when I put it out this way. I love ice cream, okay? I don't make any secret about that. I don't eat as much as I love it, but I love ice cream. And uh, let's just say that you decide you're going to have an ice cream party and you invite me over. I'm so happy. I'm thrilled. You, you say, hey, pastor, I've got like the best ice cream ever. It's better than you, anything else you've ever tasted. Now I'm like, okay, good. When's, when's the party? I'm coming. And you go, and, and I talk to your wife. I know your favorite flavors and everything, so I want you to come, and, but I'm a little bit weird, okay? So uh, I don't want you to eat off my dishes, so I want you to bring your own bowl. All right, look, I can live with that. I can handle weird if we're talking ice cream. All right, I'm good with it. And you go, I'm also kind of weird too. I don't want to reuse scoops and go back. So you just get one serving. You can have as much as you want in one serving. So if that's the rules and, you know, it's your house, your rules, I'm good with that. I'm still going to come, but I'm not going to show up with this bowl. (laughs) Okay, now this is like a one scoop size bowl in some people's world. But um, to me, this is like a dipping sauce bowl. Uh, why in the world would you even bother to try to eat ice cream out of it? So I'm not showing up with that kind of a bowl. One serving, um, honestly, I'm not showing up with this bowl either. It's so cute, isn't it? Nice little ice cream bowl. My wife loves cute stuff. I told you, Amazon addiction, right? So here it is, a waffle cone bowl. It's got chocolate and sprinkles across the top. It's so cute. I have never used this to eat ice cream. (laughs) It is not nearly big enough. So uh, not bringing that bowl. 
you know, I, I could show up with the bowl. This is like my usual ice cream bowl. Uh, you know, it's plastic. It's cheap. That's the, my kind of stuff. Uh, and because uh, it doesn't get cold when you're holding it filled with ice cream. Plus, it's kind of, you know, you can mound it up. For the record, you can eat four servings of Haagen-Dazs at one time in this bowl. <laughs> hey, do you guys ever read the labels on the Haagen-Dazs pints? They say it's four servings in that pint. I don't know what world they're living in. That's one serving uh, to me. So, uh, but I probably would show up with a bowl more like this, you know, because this is more of a man-sized bowl. It's not really shaped like a man bowl, but it's, uh, it doesn't matter. It could hold a lot. You could definitely overeat ice cream in this. But with your weird rules about your house and one serving, I'm showing up with this bowl. <laughs> I have to bring my own bowl? Fine. I got no problem with that. Let's eat some ice cream. How much do you have? Because I got this bowl. Now, um, truthfully, confessionally, I've eaten ice cream out of this bowl. <laughs> I would say I'm not proud, but actually I am. Uh, the, uh, it was gifted to me by someone who wanted to see me eat ice cream out of it after I shared this illustration, and I obliged, and I've got no problem doing that. So, uh, Ego, that's a goofy illustration. We're not going to, we're going to provide you with a bowl, and you can go back as many times as you want at my house if you come over for ice cream. Great. But let me just kind of rephrase this. God is throwing a party, and he's invited us to come, and he said, I'm going to bless you incredibly, but I want you to bring your own bowl. And there are a lot of us who are at God's party, and we're saying, God, we want more blessings. Fill us up with blessings. And how come that person has more blessings than me? And how come they're blessed more than I am? It's not fair, God. I want more blessings. And God's like, you moron, bring a bigger bowl. <laughs> I don't think God would actually call us a moron, but that's how I feel. Because God's filled it up. He's given us all that we can handle by the measure that we choose. And so if you want more blessings, bring a bigger bowl. I mean, really, honestly, in God's economy, why would you ever show up with this kind of bowl anyway and just skip all that stuff? Let's just go for the big stuff. But the measure you use, it's going to be measured back to you. So if you want more kindness in your life and less judgment, how about be kind and stop judging people? Show them mercy and, and graciousness. Just forgive people and watch the grace and forgiveness flood into your life. It's amazing how God begins to reconcile our, our relationships when we start being full of grace and mercy towards people. And you want more blessings in your life? Then why don't you step into generosity and say, okay, God, you bless me. I'm going to bless others. Now, here's the thing that you need to understand. We decide the amount we receive, but God determines the blessings. Uh, in other words, if you're showing up to God's ice cream party, you can bring whatever size bowl you want, but he gets to pick the flavor for us. He gets to pick the flavor for us because he knows us better than we know ourselves. And here's the reality. A lot of us uh, have been introduced wrongly to the idea, or we read it and get the idea, that, that we get to pick the blessings that God's going to give us. And because we're sinners, we tend to choose the least important blessings in the kingdom of God. We, get, we scrape the bottom of the barrel in the stuff that we want. We want all the stuff that's temporary, and God wants to give us eternal blessings. Let me get real, real blunt. What are, what are the things that most people really, really want God to bless them with? Let's see, um, more money, because we're deep in debt, right? More money and better health. That's what, those are the blessings that a lot of times we go, okay, I want to be blessed with more money and better health. And, and here's the reality. Uh, more money is not going to make you happier. More money is not going to make you more joyful, more loving. All the fruit of the Spirit, more money is not going to make that happen. And, and, and so uh, money is not the answer. We, we like it, but we like it for all the wrong reasons, really. And, and here's the other thing. By the way, money, you can't take it with you. So no matter how much God gives you, it's not going to translate to eternity. In fact, do you guys know what the streets of heaven are paved with? Gold. You know what that means? That means that what we value in heaven is used for asphalt there. 
We, we value it here, but there it's like nothing. I mean, how, how impressed is the bank going to be if you go down there and want to deposit some pavement in the bank? <laughs> it's not. Money doesn't translate to trade. By the way, in case you didn't realize this, if you're a follower of Jesus, then that means you're a son and daughter of God. You've been adopted into his family, and Scripture says that you're joint heirs with Jesus. Guess what? Jesus owns everything. You're not going to be poor in eternity. Other thing, we want, we want God to make us healthy. God, make us healthy. God, heal me. I'm hurting. God, I, I want to live longer. Heal me. Make me. And, and that's great. Sometimes God shows up miraculously and he heals people. Sometimes he does it through medicine and he heals people. And, and you know what happens when God heals you? You still die. I, I really hate to break this to you, but it's appointed unto man once to die. I thought I shared that earlier. And then judgment. In other words, we're, we're still going to die. These bodies that we live in are, are corrupted by sin. They're, they're destined for death. They're headed that way. We can't really fix that. You know all those people Jesus healed in, in the Bible? They're dead. <laughs> you know, Lazarus is not going to walk through the door and go, hey, guys, Jesus raised me from the dead 2,000 years ago. No, you know what happened to Lazarus after Jesus raised him from the dead? He died later. I think he's the angriest man in the Bible, too, because he had to die twice. We only have to die once. He had to die twice. What kind of a raw deal is that? And, and so here's the thing. I, I just want you to consider this. We're, we're, our bodies, you know, if God heals them, we're going to be healthy right up until the day we die. But when we die, we get new bodies. Bodies that never get old, never get sick, never get hurt, never get corrupted. I'm ready for the trade-in. You know, I never understood that it would just hurt to sleep. And if you're young, you don't understand that. But... Uh, but here's the deal. It's an upgrade, a serious upgrade. And, you know, uh, it's not like going from the iPhone 6 to the iPhone 10. It's like major. And we just, we cling to this idea, God bless me so that we can be blessed for a little while. And God wants to bless us for all eternity. His blessings are better than what we want if we'll trust him. If we'll trust him. But do you want God to bless you more? Because uh, we get to determine the amount we receive. Finally, how does this principle play out at Calvary? Uh, I mean, because we're teaching this stuff, this reciprocity thing. Uh, so let me just share with you briefly Calvary's principles of generosity. Uh, I want you to hear this if you haven't heard this before. Because this is how we kind of interpret this stuff that Jesus is talking about here in the church. First of all, these are three, three statements that, that I just want you to know, this is how we approach the whole subject of money. First of all, God does not need your money. God doesn't need your money. Uh, God's the creator of everything that is. He's the owner of everything that is. Everything you have, God gave you. He's not running out. He doesn't need your money. He's God. He doesn't need anything from us. Secondly, the church doesn't need your money. That may be shocking to some of you because you grew up like I did hearing lots of churches, lots of ministries say, if you don't give, this ministry will stop. We need you to give. I don't think that's theologically true. I don't think that's biblically true. The church, as defined in Scripture, is the bride of Jesus. So if Jesus has incredible wealth and his bride has something that she needs, don't you think Jesus is going to take care of the bride that he loves? Yeah, he, he is. God can fund whatever ministry God wants to fund. And God will fund whatever ministry he chooses to fund to glorify his name. That's reality. The church doesn't need your money. Third statement, it's wise to be generous. It's wise to be generous. In reality, uh, another way I like to put this is we, as followers of Jesus, need to give. We need to give. Because if our... If generosity is the path to blessings, it is in our own personal interest to be as generous as possible. It's in our own personal interest to bring the bigger bowl. So does this make sense to you? Does this resonate as you look at Scripture and as you think about your relationship to Christ? Do you believe the biblical principle of reciprocity? Are you going to choose a bigger bowl? You see, money talks. Does your money say that you're wise? You're the one who makes the choice. I'm praying that all of us 
would live lives that reflect the wisdom of Christ. Let's pray.